Buenas tardes desde Bruselas, bienvenidos a todos. Vamos a celebrar la tercera y la última jornada de esta Je n'ai pas de son. Iberoamericana ECR Eurolat, la primera que se hace de esta naturaleza. Eh, estamos ahora mismo en el último tema, que es el que nos va a cerrar este, estas tres jornadas consecutivas. Good afternoon to everyone. Today is the closing journey of this uh, three day summit, and we're going to talk about narco states, mafia states, and how drug trafficking has been pervading all these governments through the means of 21st century socialism and the so-called Bolivarism movement. There is a complicity between the guerrilla, the narcotraffic and some terrorist groups that still do persist in Latin America. We are going to go through all these issues. And you can also follow us through the social networks, YouTube and Facebook, ECR Eurolat, hashtag ECR Eurolat. Facebook and Twitter are also available. And before that, let's just uh, start. We have seen briefly a highlight of the situation, and we do have two guests, the IMEPI Lusa Tomasic. She has a very long and vast experience in narco traffic. She was telling us before how she had been fighting many forces of the narco traffic, and she was successful in imprisoning them, some of them. Thank you very much for your presence here. Also, thank you to Herman Tert, the person to whom we need to be thankful for, because he is the creator of this summit. Thank you very much for your presence. Good afternoon. We have a historian and a researcher in the United States that knows Cuba very, very well, Mike Gonzalez. Very welcome, Mike, to our session. We want to listen to you closely and your contributions on this analysis that you've been showing us and going through. You're comparing, basically, the social unrest from Chile and the explosion together with Colombia and the movement of Black Lives Matter. I'd like you to elaborate on that and find all the common threads. Good afternoon, everyone, from this part of the former Spanish Empire. Good afternoon. Did you hear my question? Yes, yeah, sure. I heard it. So go ahead. Go ahead. We're listening. Thank you very much for this question. We all know that Hugo Chavez, since 
the beginning wanted to use the cocaine from FARC in order to flood the United States with this cocaine and destabilize this way the country. But the Trump administration decided the following, to support Maduro's government, the one that wanted uh, the continuation of Chavez, and back in October 2019, he threatened to create a tornado of the Bolivarian movement. Sebastián Pineda, a minister who's conservative and supports the United States policies, decided to bring up uh, the prices of the public transport, and that triggered a great chaos. Nobody wanted to pay the new price of the public transport. There were demonstrations all over the country. 78 um, metro stations were burned or damaged, and this was organized through social media. The same situation happens in Ecuador in that very same month with a leftist government, but once in power, he transformed his policies. And in that very same year, 2019, decides to stop subsidizing oil. And the country blows up in unrest, and they ch need to change the capital even from Quito to Guayaquil. And the third country we're talking about is Colombia. And the event that triggered the situation, and in Colombia, of course, is headquarters for FARC. The government, conservatives as well, went through a fiscal reform and faced the very same chaos in the country. What can we find in common? All these countries were governed by conservatives supporting Trump. The, very, the three countries were interconnected. There was a connection between the left, the Cuban authorities, and the drug mafias. And in the three cases, social media are used to orchestrate and organize the riots. There is a researcher in the United States who finds out the following from the almost 5 million tweets that triggered the fire, like the fire in Chile, in Colombia, those tweets were started in Caracas and the Havana. Another finding is that 0.5% of these Twitter accounts create almost 30% of the riots. So this is really chilling to see the very same pattern repeated. The tragic death of George Floyd in May last year catalyzed also these riots in the United States. These people wanted to transform society. I talked to this researcher, and he told me that the Defense Department is not allowed to investigate the connections between Caracas and Black Lives Matter. But now I've written a book on that. It's going to be released in September, but we do know that one of the founders of Black Lives Matter is closely connected to Maduro. Back to back in 2015, she writes a manifesto praising him because direct democracy is what she defends and she criticizes harshly the opposition. 
and called them white settlers. And they deserve what they gave. So we need to ask ourselves about this pattern and all these connections, this model of riots, FARC, Venezuela, Cuba. There's something over there. Many people are asking themselves in Latin America this thing. This is a very interesting theory. The connections seem to be very clear. How can we establish these connections? We need to find out, and maybe you will do that in your book. I'd like to ask our MEP if she agrees with this analysis and what is her view on this. Well, of course, I agree. And uh, I just want to tell you that uh, more than 20 years ago, the first summit between the EU, um, Latin America, and the Caribbean held in the Rio de Janeiro broached the issue of global drug trafficking. The connection in combating drug smuggling developed, but numbers and facts today are still astounding. In 2019, the three major cocaine producing countries of the world were Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. The trade in the in the, in the drug, illicit drugs, uh, uh, remained the largest um, criminal market in the connection in combating drug smuggling developed, but numbers and facts are still astounding. The three major cocaine producing countries of the world were, like I said before, I just wanna, uh, I just wanna um, accent it again, were Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. The trade in illicit drugs remaining, the largest criminal market in the EU estimated at a minimum retail value of 30 million euros, that uh, minimum value for each year in the European Union. COVID-19 did not stop the trafficking. The virus was initially disrupted. Um, the illegal drug industry with international supply chains disrupted and millions of customers on, uh, they were all on lockdown. However, drug traffickers have risen to the challenge. For instance, instead of uh, picking small quantities and, uh, and uh, packing them in various bunch of uh, airplanes um, uh, and uh, trains, um, now what they're doing is um, they started packing huge loads of cocaine into the fewer containers, ships, and commercial um, airplanes. They're ready to take higher risk to deliver their wares. Um, challenge is com complex and huge. Looking at uh, many ways how to address it, I would like to touch upon the use of new technologies. Indeed, this provides new instruments for criminal organizations. And on the contrary, they could help us to find new instruments and to effectively, effectively fight drug trafficking. And in that, I can give you two examples. Communication channels, the use of new technologies establish drug smuggling groups to communicate safely through encrypted messages and thus to improve the efficiency of product delivery and distribution. It also protects them against investigation agencies. Thanks to digital attacks against intelligence activities of drug law enforcement agencies, however, an effective response can be found in July 2020, French and Dutch law enforcement and judicial authorities, with the support of the EU agencies, Europol and Eurojust, presented impressive results with the joint investigation team to dismantle EncroChat, an encrypted phone network used by criminal networks, and thus used for large-scale drug transporting. And the other one is money laundering. Criminal organizations continue to use traditional money laundering methods through casinos or trading in high value commodities. However, modern methods have emerged. It has compl complicated the detection of laundering of drug related funds. Today, purchasing goods and transferring money is easier thanks to, to technological innovation. It is also seamless and safer 
for drug organizations. Besides, drug traffickers are able to use virtual currency, particularly the Bitcoin, to launder elect profit. Anti-money laundering regulations are crucial in this sense. It is true that reinforced cooperation in money laundering is already part of uh, our association agreement with and then communities Central America, but more needs to be done and we go, and we go further. These provisions must be reinvigor reinvigorated and they have to be properly enforced, which means if we really want to catch up with them, we have to, uh, we have to uh, work much harder. Sí. Uh, German. German. Which is your analysis as an MEP with this issue that your colleague is explaining? Yes, there are great possibilities in this aspect. And I wanted to go back to what Mike Gonzalez was saying. It is paramount to see how all these Elements have been cooperating in a really sophisticated way, cartels, governments, and organizations, political communist organizations, terrorist organizations. They work the very same way. The Foro de Sao Paulo is funding all this, especially when Chavez uh, got into power. That was the government that uh, created that, um, that forum. But actually it was in Cuba. The rest are just um, additions. But Cuba is the brain behind all this. But there are 12, 13, 14. At some point, the great power of the Sao Paulo Forum and its capacity to pervade everything and the oil industry was a great money-making machinery. Back then, the bar was $150, so everyone was oozing in money, and that's why they could buy in Europe and Africa and Middle East, Iran, the cooperation with this country, with Iran, created that this country has a protagonism in Latin America. That's why we have Hezbollah in every single Latin America country. We have Hezbollah in Peru, Colombia, Ecuador. And that is the result of that former time and that cooperation. PDVSA, with the support and cooperation of many Spanish leaders and billionaires that are in Spain and in the United States, providing and actually plundering from this company all that money, leaving Venezuela without any capacity of recovering itself. And now Venezuela is just living on top of the great known oil reserve, the greatest oil reserve known in the world. But we see that fruit is disappearing in Cuba. We see that maybe in Spain they will de devastate the olive oil market. Communists are capable of everything. So that, in that moment, the power was great. And they moved into the cocaine market. And this is what's happening today. Cocaine nourishes not only the mafias, but also the state of Caracas and Havana, because that is the former place where drug trafficking started. All this traffic is coordinated with Cuba, and the FARC are involved as well, and the government and the military. This is the greatest organization. And Pastrana, Mr. Pastrana was 
mentioning that he is the greatest cocaine market in the world. And it's connected with the FARC, the ELN, and the cartel of the generals and Maduro in Venezuela. They have also all the airports there, private airports. They are buying the continent slowly but surely, and they jumped into Spain. There is a project of a party, a party who is now in power, and this is nothing, this is no serendipity at all. It should not surprise us that the representative of Cuban negotiations is now in the Spanish Parliament, Enrique de Santiago. This person was supposed to be a lawyer, the lawyer of the FARC back then in those negotiations. So, this man was on the side of Maduro, like Monedero as well, like Iglesias as well, and Ferro as well, who's connected to Castillo. Sorry. And he's connected to Castillo in Peru, and so many other things. Mike, how is it possible for us to be talking about this, about Cuba, after all these many years? Cuba as a ground zero of this extensive ne drug trafficking network. It is the brain behind all this, and it just controls the strings. It's true what Germán was saying before, oil and PDVSA, totally bankrupt. Is this government an illicit association of narco-traffickers? Are they just making money for themselves? There's another kind of traffic, diamond, gold, coltan. How can this be sustained when we are talking about failed regimes? We cannot talk about Venezuela and Cuba. We should talk about Cubazuela. The many power in Caracas, the authorities, Back in 2019, Maduro seemed to want to leave after the demonstrations, but he was asked not to do that. There are many Cuban agents. They have not a very good relationship with, Cuban, with um, Venezuelan people. There have been a number of investigations in that respect. Ideology is paramount. It's like religion. Rome was ruling in Europe for many centuries. Its influence was great. And Cuba is the Rome of Marxism in this hemisphere, and it still is. And it was like that up to 1991, and the Soviet Union defended it. And this is a nuclear force. No one wanted to go back to the Cuban crisis of the 1963. So, what was done is to control Havana and then found somebody else, another pimp, so to say, in Venezuela, when Chavez appeared. But all these leaders, Maduro, Morales, Correa, back to the day, Lula da Silva, all of them believe in Marxism. The very same way Philip II believed in Christianity and the Catholic Church. And so they obey the orders of Havana. Yes, but why do they obey? Which is the explanation for this? As I said, it's ideology. Ideology replaced religion. 
they are Marxists. They do believe what they say. It, it, sorry, but I'm going to interrupt you. Ideology is a well valued in the stock market. What is more important, ideology or money? Because it's the leaders that um, are wealthy, but not their countries. So ideology shouldn't be an excuse to create this kind of mafias. On the one hand, we have the money and the ideology on, of the FARC and then the ideology in the Havana. So we have Maduro, Castillo, Morales. All these people have been making choices. But let's see, Chavez, Chavez loved Castro. It was like his ideological father for him. I know someone who talked to Castro. And he said that Chavez was an ignorant person. But Chavez did admire Castro. Why? Because of ideological reasons. Why did he give him money? Because of ideological reasons. I think we need to say goodbye and we're going to stay here in the studio with our guests and we're going to welcome Mother West. You're very welcome to continue following us with the broadcast. We're going to talk about the phenomenon Casti with Castillo phenomenon in Peru. We're going to see the links with Sendero Luminoso with the drug trafficking. He says that nothing can be proved and he's relaxed like a cat upside. And he says that he is committed to fight the narco traffic. Thank you very much for your presence in here. And we're going to welcome the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much, Mike. Bye-bye. Let's welcome Aldo Mariatani. He's from Peru, journalist and lawyer, Vladimir Petit, Nitu Pérez, journalist and his wife, a very, very well-known journalist in Venezuela. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. Are we on air? Fantastic. So we were talking about Peru, Aldo Mariatiki, very welcome. From, are you in Madrid? Good afternoon. You're in Puerto Santa Maria and we are in Brussels. We were talking about Peru before. If I'm not wrong, Peru is the second world producer of cocaine. Corruption is also pursing the country and uh, bribing, drug trafficking. This is the country with more detained and processed presidents. Alberto Fujimori went to prison and also Alan Garcia had to pay with his life. These three champions of Colombia and Bolivia and Peru, can Peru leave narcotraffic behind? We're going to have narcotraffic. Colombia exports cocaine to the USA through Mexico. And Peru and Bolivia do the same through Brazil and some countries in Africa to the United, to the European Union. There is not much worry and concern of the um, U.S. citizens with this narcotraffic, but as long as there is demand, there's going to be drug trafficking. It is easy for those countries to produce the plant, but there have been some trials 
and they have been growing it in the Amazon. That might make Brazil another world producer. But this is the reason why these countries are the first ones. Indonesia also explored a bit this market, but that's the situation now. We will have to debate a proposition suggested by some North American presidents. For example, let's legalize drug, and this will end the whole thing. Let's just go to Venezuela with our two guests. Venezuela does not produce cocaine, but it has been supporting a regime, the Bolivarian regime, and many of the neighboring countries and also many countries in Europe do not dare call it a dictatorship. But you do affirm that this is a narco state. What is the big picture in Venezuela now? Of course, thank you very much. I'd like to go back to a question, an excellent question you posed before. And I'd like to say that Cuba is not only the logic, it's the new Asian empire. It has a very strong power. Every organized crime, crime, the structure is international. My country nowadays, it is the headquarters, the commercial headquarters in which the commodities that are produced in Colombia find their way to the world. And this is a consequence of many connections that are very scary. At this stage of the game, we should bear in mind clearly that politics are the means to support and continue this. Power is the ingredient in order to control the things. But they need to be on their own. That's why when they get into the power, they eliminate all the opponents and they try to eliminate all the symbols in order to uh, make sure that there's nothing left after them. In Venezuela, the first thing they did is redo all the system of power to be the kings of the territory. This way allows him to establish this system, a system that should be break and stopped before getting into the power. That's the same thing you would do with Al-Qaeda. You need to stop them before they get into power. Why am I using this metaphor? Because Al-Qaeda has also a very adaptive structure. It's a combination of Escobar and terrorism. Escobar is a great ideologist behind this. Is the great political maker. Pablo Escobar could foresee the alliance with ETA in that very moment so that they have the Islamic terrorism connected in every country. The big picture and the great power that the army of Cuba and Venezuela gives you, an army that's serving the drug cartels, and they feel that they are waging a war, a war that is just and hybrid at the same time. They think that they are creating a new empire, like the Cuban one. This fight it's very, very painful. They have a transnational organization of multiple alliances, and we do need to react. We have a different kind of belief, a different kind of society in mind. Nitu. 
Vladimir, this is the ideal scenario preventing the illness from breaking out. But now we see that we have a network, a Venezuelan network, and it's a government that's working like a cartel. How can we dismantle all these pieces that are interconnected? We have the military, we have the politics. We were talking about the cartel of the soles linked to the army. Could we conceive this as a connection? Maybe these people could, uh, we could open the door for these people. We could, we, could we open the door to Maduro so that he left? But I think this is like the Hydra with so many heads. How do you picture this scene? And how could we tackle this? Is there any, we cannot hear them. There is a video that we're going to see that's going to show us the big picture of the narco-trafficking and the governments involved. UIS desarrolla la Operación Huracán Verde en la provincia de Esmeraldas, donde logra incautar casi cuatro toneladas de cocaína de propiedad de las FARC. En el contexto de esa operación, detectan la entrada de un avión marca Grunman, tipo GLF-2, que aterrizó sin autorización previa en el antiguo aeropuerto mariscal Sucre de Quito. Increíblemente, el avión permanece 13 días en el hangar presidencial. El avión que utilizaron los narcotraficantes, eh, recuerdo el nombre del piloto, era Miguel Arevalo Kressler, mexicano, era militar, piloto. Él vino con este avión y llegó... Este avión ingresó lógicamente al aeropuerto de Quito, pero cuando ya iban a hacer el, la operación los narcotraficantes para cargar la droga, se trasladó al aeropuerto de Tachina. En Esmeralda llegó el avión y la droga ya estaba en camino. Lamentablemente, por la penetración también hacia la Policía Nacional a grupos, pudieron darse cuenta de la operación que estábamos haciendo nosotros. Nos tocó adelantar y el avión despegó desde Tachina y fue a México. Nosotros capturamos la droga, capturamos la estructura de los narcotraficantes y pudimos ya establecer más amplio la estructura que estaba relacionada justamente con las FARC. De acuerdo a los convenios que tenemos en México, se logró enviar la información, el avión llegó a México, el avión fue detenido y el piloto también. Cuando hicieron un escáner de todo el avión, encontraron las partículas de droga. O sea, no era la primera vez que ese avión iba a transportar droga. Entonces ya determinamos cómo funcionaba esto. Gracias a Huracán Verde, la UIS pudo determinar varios nexos de las FARC con miembros de la Policía Nacional y, lo más grave, con funcionarios del gobierno de Rafael Correa. Dentro de la investigación policial, se estableció que José Ignacio Chauvin, en ese momento funcionario del Ministerio de Gobierno, fue quien retiró dinero en efectivo de la aeronave mexicana para la compra de droga a las FARC. En la investigación, surgen por primera vez vinculados al poder político los nombres de los hermanos Jefferson, Miguel y Edison Ostaiza, generando enorme incomodidad al interior del gobierno. En síntesis, Ecuador cambió a una unidad de inteligencia contra el crimen organizado por una unidad de inteligencia política, expulsó a su principal aliado en el combate contra el narcotráfico y dejó de vigilar sus cielos. Nitu, could you see the video? I saw a piece and it's so very important. Going back to your question, Carmen, if this original carcinogenic tumor is in Cuba and now has metastasized in, across the whole region, and it's going to reach Spain and Italy, 
and many other European countries. I want to make clear the following. In the human history, there is no other case in which a state is turned in a narco state. Everything, absolute, completely everything, is aimed and geared towards the drug traffic, airports, ports, that um, where there is a huge drug flow. And it's very easy to bribe a state worker, but actually the army and the uh, state workers do work for this enterprise, so to say. This is also linked to what you mentioned before, Cartel of Soles. We are not talking here like the Cartel de Cádiz in Colombia. Of course, governments were fighting them back. Or Tassinaloa, sometimes the presidents just uh, give a blind eye. We are talking in Venezuela about a cartel in which the, the head of the cartel is the Nicolás Maduro. So the main enemy to fight against is the Venezuelan regime. Why? In order to stop this cancer that is metastasizing. One of the goals in order to protect the region, to protect Spain and Europe, has to be through a change of government. And elections is not going to make it for us. We are not talking about politicians. We are talking about criminals. And so we need to deal with them like you would deal with criminals. So we need to corner them legally and penally and criminally. What is doing the European Union to avoid this? Is the European Union doing enough? Could they do more? The role of the European Union has been widely criticized in this respect. And also, and specifically, the role of Spain, because it has always been the bridge between Latin America and Europe. We're talking about Spain. So, we need to do much more. We can, we can do much better. And uh, we should cooperate much, uh, much better. Uh, there's an example. Croatia is a very small country of 4 million population. And a few months ago, we had uh, uh, 500,000 kilos pure cocaine in Port of Ploče. That was a result of uh, working with, uh, with the people from, uh, from South Africa, from America, from uh, European Union. So uh, we can do it if we want to. And one example of uh, strategic um, cooperation is uh, that we have uh, with, um, with Mexico. The agreement signed in July 2020 will allow the government of Mexico to intelligently combat illicit arms trafficking, which is linked to drug smuggling, and to expand international strategic cooperation regarding drug trafficking, along with other serious crimes, such as sexual abuse and exploitation, terrorism, human trafficking, among others. And we also provide Mexican security forces with a training in the evolution of crime and the use of new technologies while considering the protection of personal data. This initiative is what we need. Us cooperation is key to tackle encryption and other new technology related methods employed by drug trafficking groups. Uh, you have to know in the summer of 2020, Eurojust and Iber Red signed an implementing arrangement to improve exchange of information and Eurojust communication with judicial authorities in Latin America throughout greater access to the Iber at secure communication system. This enabled safe, real-time communication with other contract 
points of Iber Red in Latin America, who are experiencing experienced judges, prosecutors, and uh, central authorities with competence and in international legal cooperation, um, and that really matters in their countries. This constitutes yet another stop towards closer cooperation without the need to refer to a legal framework to exchange operational and personal data. Furthermore, Eurojust and Latin American countries established in March 2021 contact points for judicial cross-border assistance. Uh, with all this innovation, cooperation, I think we can do it, but more skilled officers, less politics. The more politics is worse job. <laughs> But this is not working. And before we were talking about Mexico, the images we have from Mexico with AMLO, with AMLO who is congratulating, congratulating the mother of uh, Mr. Guzman, and this compliance of the European Union with these agreements, Okay, there are some things that are written down on paper and then we see the European Union protecting Cuba. Cuba is the center, the, the ground zero of this situation and Cuba enjoys a, an effective protection from Europe and this is obscene to say the least. In the, in the case of Venezuela, we see that all the sanctions that are ridiculous, they don't even get um, enforced. We have a president who is a criminal and the brother as well. They come to Madrid with 40 suitcases. We don't know even what's inside of them. No one gives any explanation whatsoever. There are eight different versions of the facts. All of them are lies. And apparently, Avalos is the same one that uh, complies with the money given to a, an air company. And we see how AMLO goes to different people who are linked to the mafia, to the Chavista mafia. The power of the drug trafficking is so very huge. They already crossed the Atlantic and they have already a base in Spain. Some communists went to Venezuela, firstly the stringer, Let's just explain. Jorge Vestringe, he's an ideologist of the multipolar war, and he was in the military academy in Venezuela to talk about the multilateral war, the fourth generation war, the theories of Elis Ramirez, anti-imperialism and Islamism. He also talked about Hezbollah and Iran with the military presence in those areas and Russia. How mining is being exploited by Russia, Hezbollah, ELN, even Spanish politicians. We can see the worst of the worst in there. And it's spreading out all over the continent. Let's just observe the result of the elections in Ecuador. It is surprising the cohesion of some territories in Ecuador. We can see that some people tell you that they are under the influence of the Mexican cartels. So why do they vote? They're going to vote Correa. Why? Why do they vote Correa, the ones that have uh, mayors in the municipalities that are linked to Correa? Well, because we're talking about this very 
extensive and vast network that goes from Argentina to Ciudad Juárez and even beyond because there's also um, the United States and those links of general riot are there. Cuba has been surviving for 63 years in a, an apparently hostile environment. At the same time, developing some skills that have been seducing wills or even kidnapping wills. Wills kidnapped, politicians ideologically kidnapped. This is the mechanism, a very effective and active one. This is what we see. And Cuba is obeyed and protected by many, not only because of those remains of the romanticism back to the 60s. There are very important issues regarding this. Why is the Spanish government so soft with these countries? It's because the financial links. Mr. Maduro, Mr. Cabello, Mr. Carvajal, they know so very much about the members of this Spanish country. The government know that the wars drug trafficking in Latin America can just erase them at once if they want to. This is a danger for European security because those. this is the first round of kidnapping. There's going to be more and institutions are corrupted all over the Americas. And this is what has led us to what we see today. The MEP said that we need to improve our police forces, our state workers. We need to create better and healthier structures. We do need this, but we cannot do it unless there is a very strong political will and determination. And without a doubt that we are going to make the necessary sacrifices because we are at war and we want to win the war. We don't want to negotiate. We want to win because we want to defeat evil. We want rule of law and we want democracy. And unless we have a strong will, we will not be able to win. And this is our subject, our topic. All these politicians that try to soften positions, they have been run over. These are the politicians that are always apologizing. They're going to fall as well, like happened in Colombia and in Peru, same situation there. We depend on Cuba with this paleo-communism. Sendero Luminoso is exactly the same. They are butchers and murderers. And that's how they get into power. So the European Union needs to have the strong democratic will to fight with strength. And if we are not strong, we always lose. So this war, Herman, we are losing the battle, right? In Venezuela, these structures, this power structure of uh, illegal organization, control from the government downwards, could you please confirm this to me? Because you have really good sources. Was this idea from Chavez or, or from Castro brothers? They decided to put Chavez into power because they could control him. Could we just analyze what's happening with these collectives? There are movements that are besides the law and they are connected to Chavismo. 
and they control different territories. We were talking also about the FARC and the ELN. The remains of paramilitary bands are also within the drug trafficking. Could we actually connect all these issues? Maybe there are too many. Thank you, thank you. Maduro was a bit and a bit bet by the European, by the Cuban Empire. Maduro did not belong to the establishment from Chavez. He was not very important, but he came to be the best bet. And time has just confirmed this. There is a tricky balance between these criminal forces. We have Colombian irregulars who are living in Venezuela, and the tasks have been distributed. And Herman knows this. If we map the territory, we see the FARC and we see the opposition. We can place the ELN. We can see Islamic terrorism. And we can see this network of money laundering. This activity is the most, um, is the one that produces most financial benefits for Chavez. So Spain and European and the European Union considered this the crown jewel, and they used this money. The country is in misery and, and there's hunger all over, but there are some hubs that really get all this wealth and they are connected to the Iberian Peninsula. This very tricky balance between criminal bands is a result also of this money laundering on the one hand and the planning of the brains that control this. In Venezuela, it's very difficult to leave these groups. The structure is so very similar to Al Qaeda. We should actually destroy some of the headquarters. I'm so very grateful of this kind of initiatives in order to raise awareness of what's happening. We are romanticizing this situation. Sorry, I need to interrupt you because we are pressed by time. This romanticization of Cuba, it's very much alive these days. And that's what revives these movements. You were mentioning that Colombia, Colombia provides with the 93% of the cocaine that is exported to the states. And Peru exports to the neighboring countries and Europe. Let's talk about Bolivia. It is a very interesting phenomenon. Argentina is not a flowing space. Now it is the very kitchen where all this broth is cooked, so to say. Especially Buenos Aires, María Eugenia Vidal, it looked that everything was under control. Now, Colombia has proved how the campaign was financed by narcotraffic. We were talking about these presidents 
democratic pro, uh, presidents that, are, that have been prosecuted. Are we risking to see any government in the hands of the drug mafias? Bakamaru, for example, became famous when he assaulted the resident of the Japanese ambassador. Could we see something similar in Peru? Any Cuban president that has been supported and fed by the drug trafficking? Sorry, I wanted to go back to a context, something we were mentioning before. This is highly suspicious that the, war, the countries that belong to the Pacific Alliance, that they have commercial agreements, and others, Chile, Mexico, and Peru, specifically this and adding Colombia, are under this storm. And these groups are belonging to Mercosur. There's nothing uh, casual here. There's nothing random here. There's something behind that smells fishy. You were saying that there were no parallels with Venezuela, but I wouldn't see the same because in the 80s we were seeing a narco state. Montesinos is something else. He has he had his moment and had to negotiate. Let's go back to Operacion uh, Siberia operation with the Russian mafias connected to the FARC as well. That had to do with Montesinos' fall from power. There were also exchanges with the Vatican. I don't remember the name of this man, but he was a narco-African. Vaticano was a person who I interviewed in Castro Castro prison. Exactly. That's exactly where we close the circle, right, of what we were talking about. There are some shades, some different shades. I'd like you to tell us the very last, uh, the, freshest new of the, the freshest news after the elections. Uh, this is what I'd like to know. But we're going to do this very quickly. We're going to satisfy Herman's curiosity to be updated with an electoral analysis. It's highly complex because we are 50-50. 17 million votes and there is an unusual situation. There are revisions because we have detected so many irregularities and nothing is random here. There are very, very strange things happening. This is formal. So the, the vote counting uh, was questioned, but it's going to take a lot of time to do the revision. This revision could actually change the result and maybe turn around the winner and make a Fujimori the president. But we need to go through this to go through a proper calculation. The election has been very strange. We had Jordi Lescano, then Fujimori was fourth. Very, very weird dynamics. 
That's what I was going to tell you. Peru is always surprising. According to the last calculation that also Castillo also questioned, he would be the winner, right? And uh, 8,000 votes would be the difference, but I totally agree with you. There are candidates winning that no one seems to have voted, and so the least, the least but have won, so to say. If Kafka were Peruvian, that's what we had, because that's the kind of world we live in, Kafkian. It's absolutely astonishing. It's outworldly. We have congressmen like Bermejo, and he's been prosecuted. He doesn't have a technical team. It's a disaster. He's disastrous. One million of Venezuelan refugees here, and they vote for Castillo. What can I tell you? We just got the message, totally. Sorry, but uh, we don't have much time to listen to the colleague. I want to go to a very specific topic, the narcotraffic and these regimes that are, per se, drug traffickers. Does this seem to you outworldly? And the states are supporting this regime. So could you be very, very brief? Because I think they're going to shut me up. I totally understand. And I understand Herman's curiosity with Peru. I said this at the beginning. We are talking about a criminal complex. That's why we need the criminal court to deal with it. That's why I think that today's meeting is paramount. We need to make pressure internationally to fight them and prosecute them with all the legal mechanisms at our disposal. There are very well respected societies and people in Latin America. We need to reactivate Palermo. We need to work from the International Court of Human Rights. These people, these cr criminals need to be penalized because they are destroying the region and beyond. A last sentence to wrap up the session, a last reflection or idea of what we've been talking about. Well, I jotted down as everybody were talking. So um, I think innovation and cooperation are the way forward. As technologies are improving, they provide new tools for criminal organization, but also new instruments for public authorities to dismantle them. Moreover, obviously, global solutions to global problems is the key. Muy bien. Germán, tu conclusión final. Thank you very much. Germán, have a wish. Our situation is uh, that one of decay, passivity, confusion. I don't know if now that Colombia is in danger, I don't know if Colombia is going to call the alarm and maybe the neighbors will react. But we do need strong political positions, politicians with determination. We don't want people who just disagree and they're going to talk about and they're going to do other things with other policies. We're talking about criminals here. As if we were talking about Hitler back to the day. We're talking about people like the Nazis. They are a band and we need to fight it. There's no negotiation possible. And those who negotiate, 
And those who want to convince us that you can always find an agreement with mm, criminals, they actually complicit it so that criminals can just thrive and continue their status quo and benefiting from it. They have increased their power in Chile. They've done the same in Bolivia again, and they are solidly consolidated in Cuba, and they are just extending and pervading everywhere. There's no evil that lasts a hundred years, as we say in Spanish. These are the rules. This is the, your initiative, Herman. And we thank you very much. This Eurolat Ibero-American Summit. We're going to say goodbye, but we're going to come back in five minutes for the proper wrap-up with very important people and experts from the European. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much from the European <laughs> panel. The ECR group is the voice of Eurorealism, the sensible middle way between ever more Europe and no Europe, with respect for the sovereignty of Europe's national democracies, with less bureaucracy, more fiscal responsibility, and equality for all member states. We believe the peoples of Europe want the European Union to do less and to do it better, to promote economic recovery and growth and more jobs, to help, not hinder our countries in getting immigration under control, to deliver a clean environment at a cost we can afford, to work with global partners to protect our security, to create jobs through free and fair trade. Europe should only act where it can deliver real added value to member states and their citizens. By putting Europe's national democracies back in the driving seat, we can build a Europe that will offer our countries a platform for cooperation, that will help promote European prosperity and security for generations to come. Sin fe, no habría Europa. La liberté est le fondement de l'Europe. Respect for das gemeinsame Erbe. Tradition binds our continent. Non c'è valore più importante della famiglia. Europa è dobra wspólna. Różnimy się, ale powinno nas łączyć wspólne dziedzictwo. Powróćmy do Unii Europejskiej, która z tego dziedzictwa wyrasta i która szanuje narodowe tożsamości. Only the European Union without arrogance, based on solidarity and mutual respect for its member states, can regain the support of the European nations. We can do it together. There's a new hope for Europe, a Europe of jobs, prosperity, and recovery. A Europe that safeguards its citizens and borders. There's a Europe that respects its national democracies, that protects the environment and nurtures its rural economies. There's a Europe that does less and does it better that cuts bureaucracy and adds value for you. There's a Europe that looks inwards and outwards for trade, for security, and for friendship. It's time to get Europe under control and back on track. 
it's time for a new hope for Europe. It's time to reset EU. Bonjour, bonjour. Vous m'entendez Oui, c'est ça, justement. Ouais. Sin fe, no habría Europa. La libertad es el fundamento de Europa. Respect für das gemeinsame Erbe. Tradition binds our continent. Non c'è valore più importante della famiglia. Europa es dobrem wspólnym. Różnimy się, ale powinno nas łączyć wspólne dziedzictwo. Powróćmy do Unii Europejskiej, która z tego dziedzictwa wyrasta i która szanuje narodowe tożsamości. Only the European Union without arrogance, based on solidarity and mutual respect for its member states, can regain the support of the European nations. We can do it together. The ECR Group is the voice of Eurorealism, the sensible middle way between ever more Europe and no Europe, with respect for the sovereignty of Europe's national democracies, with less bureaucracy, more fiscal responsibility, and equality for all member states. We believe the peoples of Europe want the European Union to do less and to do it better, to promote economic recovery and growth and more jobs, to help not hinder our countries in getting immigration under control, to deliver a clean environment at a cost we can afford, to work with global partners to protect our security, to create jobs through free and fair trade. Europe should only act where it can deliver real added value to member states and their citizens. By putting Europe's national democracies back in the driving seat, we can build a Europe that will offer our countries a platform for cooperation 
that will help promote European prosperity and security for generations to come. There's a new hope for Europe. A Europe of jobs, prosperity, and recovery. A Europe that safeguards its citizens and borders. There's a Europe that respects its national democracies, that protects the environment and nurtures its rural economies. There's a Europe that does less and does it better that cuts bureaucracy and adds value for you. There's a Europe that looks inwards and outwards for trade, for security, and for friendship. It's time to get Europe under control and back on track. It's time for a new hope for Europe. It's time to reset EU. The ECR Group is the voice of Eurorealism, the sensible middle way between ever more Europe and no Europe, with respect for the sovereignty of Europe's national democracies, with less bureaucracy, more fiscal responsibility, and equality for all member states. We believe the peoples of Europe want the European Union to do less and to do it better, to promote economic recovery and growth and more jobs, to help not hinder our countries in getting immigration under control, to deliver a clean environment at a cost we can afford, to work with global partners to protect our security, to create jobs through free and fair trade. Europe should only act where it can deliver real added value to member states and their citizens. By putting Europe's national democracies back in the driving seat, we can build a Europe that will offer our countries a platform for cooperation that will help promote European prosperity and security for generations to come. Sin fe, no habría Europa. La liberté est le fondement de l'Europe. 
Respekt für das gemeinsame Erbe. Tradition binds our continent. Non c'è valore più importante della famiglia. Europa è dobra wspólna. Różnimy się, ale powinno nas łączyć wspólne dziedzictwo. Powróćmy do Unii Europejskiej, która z tego dziedzictwa wyrasta i która szanuje narodowe tożsamości. Only the European Union without arrogance, based on solidarity and mutual respect for its member states, can regain the support of the European nations. We can do it together. mucha publicidad ¿eh? que, eh, que sigo sigo voy a la despedida hasta luego Buenas tardes otra vez. Good afternoon once again. It was a bit longer than five minutes, but we're back here to talk about this Latin American summit organized by ECR Eurolat and the promoter of this great idea was Vox with Mr. Hernandez that is here with us today. We will have now a questions round, or more than questions, reflections about the scope of this summit and the outcomes of this summit. We will have Maria Corina Machado from Venezuela and also Carlo Fidanza from the Vice President ECR Eurolat and also Herman, who is the President. Also, we have remotely Carlo. Carlo, good afternoon. Thank you for being here with us. I would like to know your stake to, st stock stake of this three days summit where we try to tackle the relations between EU and Latin America, how to fight against the drug trafficking and the governments that are part of the drug regime, how to create the guidelines of the free trade agreements, what kind of relations do we have to have and how to create that bridge and trust between each other to succeed, to have more development and to have this great Latin American and European community in a development path and to be successful in this 21st century. Why not? That it's, uh, it seems to be quite complicated with this pandemic that has changed our mindset, our perspectives, our ideologies as well. Uh, some ideologies are coming stronger than ever. So, Carlo, I don't know if you are listening to us, and uh, yeah, if so, you can take the floor now. I think there's some technical issues. Then we will give the floor directly to Maria Corina Machado from Caracas. Good afternoon, Maria. Thank you very much for being here with us. She is the president of Vente Venezuela. Maria Corina Machado is a splendid woman, fighter, and she's been struggling physically, mentally from the beginning, and he's, uh, she's uh, been very coherent from the onset, and she's one of the opponents to Venezuela, and she, she's the uh, target because she says there's no space for dialogue for people as Nicolas Maduro. What do you have to say? when you've been targeted as uh, you have been. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for this unique chance of being here. And uh, my beloved friend, Mr. Herman, uh, firstly, we have to reflect if we need a real a new stage on this relations you Latin America. And if so, what are the aims? What are the enemies we're facing? And this is something that has changed from the last 20 uh, years, or even five years ago. The events in Latin America and 
changing rapidly and we've been destroying the democracy and the roots of this process are even clearer. So that's why I think that we ha it is important from the pro Democrats of Western Europe to uh, call everything crystal clear. There is a global process against our ideologies, our peace, uh, the family justice, and doubtfully, and they're trying to decrease and destroy the liberal democracy. And there's something that's happening as well, and it's affecting Venezuela directly, but all of us as well, all the Western democracies. And in this context, I have to mention some of the failures that have happened. Firstly, to believe that this is a problem of authoritarian policy, uh, politicians, and it's not true. We are facing criminals, criminals that have been using ideological uh, image from the Foro of Sao Paulo and Puebla as well, but they have the support of a geopolitical operation from Russia, China, Turkey, and of course, Cuba. I have to mention as well, within these relations between EU and Latin America, the sadness, that sadness that we see from a Spain that culturally has been the bridge and the channel of Latin America and EU. And it's nowadays under this new political power uh, and has become a defensor of these policies. And now we see what's happening in Cuba, Venezuela, in Colombia. But I would like to highlight it as much as possible. In Colombia, we are conducting an expansion of the criminality process here. Can you imagine what it will entail to Latin America and to Europe as well? What will happen if criminals take power from the Mediterranean to the from the Pacific to the Atlantic more than 12,000 hectares of drug manufacturing in the hands of FARC and other uh, parties so we have to be very clear here we wish we wish to have a, s a solution throughout conventional process and through a regular elections we wish to have a real dialogue so they can resign and give up the power and to have a democratic transition but we've had 15 dialogues process and today mr borrell is the big advisor and defender of these policies to try to f promote maduro's policies to try to create other policies that are profiting from the hunger of the venezuelan citizens my last remarks are to review our narrative, we have to call everything as it is and not be in the narrative of the regime. We're not giving up. On the contrary, we are standing and we won't fall in new trumps and, try, and we will try to make those spaces more comfortable for all of us. Secondly, this initiative I think is crucial to create a working group of the true dissidents existent in, Car in Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, with the real Democrats, both from uh, the Western world and from Europe, that already understand what's happening and, and they understand that we have to do something for the future to create this working group. And finally, I would like to ask you to all of the MEPs and everyone listening to us today, the necessary pressure that we have to do at international level so all crimes are sanctioned 
We have a huge operation looking for uh, lifting the sanctions, hindering the process before the ICC, and to pressure on the countries where these operations are taking place so nothing happens to them. Those are the concrete areas where we will, will need to progress. Thank you very much. We will give the floor now to Carlos Fidanza to see if throughout this summit we have or we have not understood this narrative because now we love this uh, speech or, ra or nar narrative. But that's the uh, truth in uh, Europe or in some sectors within Europe. And this summit makes everything more clear. And I would like, Carla, to give us your, um, your review of this summit. Is it this the first step? Yeah, first of all, thank you again, Carmen, and, uh, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, special uh, warm uh, greeting to uh, Maria Corina. Uh, I have a, a bit of a return on my, on the translation of myself. So I asked uh, our <laughs> operators to, <laughs> to take it off. No, please. Okay, let's gusta try, escucharte let's por duplica. We, lo we love to, to listen to you twice, actually. Difficult for me to because I, I, I hear my translation. So, uh, and I, I want to uh, to really thank again Herman Tersh for uh, having uh, wanted very uh, strongly this uh, uh, this uh, intergroup, this this working group, this event. Very interesting. Three days of work, purposes, uh, proposals. Uh, and uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, views from uh, many of our friends in Latin America. Uh, we uh, created this working group dedicated to Aerolat because we are convinced that Latin America can become prosperous, strong, free, and that it can do so together with Europe in the light of our similarities in language, history, and culture. We firmly believe in the strategic alliance and uh, we cannot accept that the European institutions are unable to, unable to take strong positions against authoritarian regimes. Uh, Maria Corina mentioned m m several of m m many of them. Of them. Uh, we fully uh, agree, we share the, the, the battle for, for freedom in all these countries and the, in, enforcing the network of all the democratic uh, patriotic and uh, movements for freedom is our priority in political terms and this is the uh, real aim for what we established this working group. So enforce our bilateral relationships, having and being part of a common network of cultural and political forces to, uh, to uh, fight together for liberty, for freedom, for democracy, for security of our people and for the future of hope of, of these people. I have to say also as an Italian member of this uh, European Parliament that naturally, you know, we have uh, millions of uh, Italian origin uh, uh, citizens in Latin America, many of them also in Venezuela fighting for freedom or being refugees uh, due to the uh, poverty caused by Maduro, Maduro's regime. And we are at their side we uh, are uh, fighting at all levels also in our own country because you have to know that Italy was the, uh, the only country that tried to stop uh, the uh, common recognition two years ago, maybe two years and a half ago, of uh, um, uh, Juan Guaido as legitimate president of the National Assembly in, uh, in Venezuela, for example, a very uh, heavy fault of our Italian government and the same behavior we have in the, in the European institutions as perfectly Maria uh, has mentioned in, his interven in her intervention. So uh, we are at your side and we want to give this strong message to all the friends that are following us in Latin America. You have friends on this side of Atlantic and we are, are at your side in your battle for freedom. Uh, 
We have Venezuela through uh, our remote video and Marina, Maria Corina rightly targeted the, the disillusionment of the Spanish government. And here we have uh, Mr. Carl, uh, Mr. Herman Tetch. But what can we do when we have a government and a Congress with a majority of socialists and separatists that are upholding this system? What can we do? Well, there's many things that we can do in Spain, in here, and as uh, we have already showcased throughout these three days, many things can be done wherever we are with this permanent fight for the truth and not giving up with these untruthful narratives of the official speech and discourse that we're listening, this tricky and, and untruthful speech. I'm very, very happy to have you all here. Thank you very much, Maria Corina. Thank you, Carlo, as well for all your support, because this is a huge positive step forward. That's the message that Jean Paul II sent in Poland, and he said, do not resign to Nicaraguan citizens, Cubans, Venezuelans, all those people fighting for 63 years. You have the same right to be free as we have, because if you, re if you don't resign, the strong people here will be able to make the weakest to lose. And we want the freedom to be a patrimony and a right of all the citizens, both in Latin America and in Europe. And that's the message we wanted to convey. And that's what we're saying here today. Let's move. Let's do what we couldn't do before. Let's speak up. In Spain, we've seen it with Mr. Abascal. We've seen it with Vox that is uh, uh, rising in, in Fratelli in, in Italy as well. We are creating the uh, truth message. We have to speak up clearly. We have to, to tell the truth. Let's not hide behind the cowardly quotidianity and trying to create parks with the evil. No, let's look for the best, the freedoms, the rights, the prosperity that comes with freedom and rights and law, the law against the permanent arbitrary of the left. The arbitrary is, fr is, of, is from the left, and that is what we are looking for, because everyone has to be the same. There must be equality between men and female ag against the law, against all groups and tribes, the attempts of breaking down the nations, the countries, and to create uh, gaps between people, pa uh, countries. We want the freedom. We want that message to be conveyed, that's the message from ECR. And from here, we'd like to thank all the ECR group for this powerful message that we're sending. And in this last day of the summit, we have to thank as well the two great interventions that we will have in a few minutes. So we're very satisfied. This is a great example of uh, what this parliament can do. This parliament has can't be dead. This is the moment to convey this uh, truth, this hope message f to everyone, both la in Latin America and in Europe. Whoever is fearful, whoever doesn't see the way out, there is hope. If we mobilize and if we keep fighting, with bravery, we will have the truth. We cannot fear nothing and no one. If no one fears anyone, it's Maria Corina, and she's been showing it throughout all these years. I will remember a sentence of Mr. Perot. Always we have to quote someone, and he said that the Peronists 
when they had a um, cat in a bag, they, it would seem that they were fighting, but no, they were reproducing. So what do we have to do so the opposition can be reproduced and to create a solid block and to create that fight against that regime? And another question, so you can respond as, as you wish. You express the opinion of Venezuela rega with regards to Europe, but what do you have to say about the US? He's um, handling as well the elections. I would like you to explain this election structure. If nothing has changed, why the elections now will be valid and no those of one year ago? Well, I will start with the first question. And Nowadays, in Venezuela, more than 90% of the population hates the representation of this regime with Maduro and his criminal structure. That is the strength. That is our democracy strength and our willing uh, wish of freedom. And the country has been suffering great deceptions. This is a great part of the population that acknowledged publicly that they were, they lost, and they telling everyone the coexistence with criminal gangs. So how can we adapt and su survive? And there will be some actors that will receive some benefits, whereas it's money, positions in, as civil servants. But it is true that as long as that regime keeps the power, the suffering of the uh, Venezuelans will, keep, will increase day in, day out. And Venezuela is under a collapse of all the institutions and also under the occupation of more than a 60% of criminal gangs with power in the territory, in the economy, in the social aspects. And I'm not talking about any region lost in Venezuela, not here in Caracas. They are, they're, they are attacking the law enfo enforcement. Be why? Well, because they've been creating this compound. So there is a sector, for whatever reasons, I won't deepen here now. They decided to coexist and they calling for resignment uh, and to accept a boat rigging, it will be a step back and it will be a great sacrifice for them. And with this, I mean that Maduro's regime has been understood as a criminal state and secondly, as an usurpatory uh, regime. If this mm, National Assembly that has been acknowledged and accepted by the international mm, bodies, if they design another body and they call for those uh, elections, if we can call it that way, the mere act action of participation is to acknowledge that assembly and to acknowledge Mr. Maduro. So you will be a step back of what we have achieved so far. I, I totally agree, Maria, but can we please be a, be a bit more brief so we can have more uh, time for other participants as well? But can you respond to that um, insatisfaction with uh, EUS throughout the, the acknowledgement and the support that they gave to these elections? Well, very briefly, the use I don't know, the, the EU's position, and that's very sad because the situation in Venezuela is changing rapidly. And as I was mentioning before, is creating a commotion in all the regions. So what will be the final position of the US? Well, no one knows. And that is very worrying. If those election, if those dialogue will be confirmed, it will be a step back from what we achieved last year's 
and it will be a great failure for their own security. Okay, in Caracas, you're saying that it is a search city, there's no law, there's no order. But I would like for you to describe what groups are you meaning? Because I understand that we have the collectives, the groups that you were mentioning before, operating under the umbrella of the government, the criminal gangs, but also are the lord of the region. And also we have the law enforcement, the army, the government. Can you describe what is the function and the role of each of them and how Caracas is, is just a cage? Well, first of all, I would like to introduce how Venezuela looks like. Uh, Caracas and Venezuela are falling. They are under the hands of criminal gangs, from drug trafficking to the extraction of gold, mining, human trafficking. Those are the cases in, in Venezuela, in all the parts in Venezuela all around the border of uh, co with Colombia is under the power of FARC. Venezuelans that are dedicated to drug trafficking and uh, fuel trafficking as well. And also th we have the gangs that are conducting illegal activities as well. And that's happening in the center of the country and in other regions as well. They have a great army, greater even to the law enforcement. And they have intelligence services as well within the law enforcement. So they know beforehand what's going to happen. And at the end of the day, the regime is just giving up space. And at the end of the day, is a structure with many criminal heads. And Maduro is just one of them. And when there is a meeting, they all gather together. And who is representing and held in Duarte, for example, the owner of the state? Herman. Maria is describing Venezuela as a cake that has been divided and shared. It is, it is true. I'm, and doubtfully, it's something that is happening as well in Spain. We see how there's some concrete interest from different people that are just bending the rules for, for their own benefits. And they create their own guitars and their own groups. And those uh, groups in Venezuela are, are plentiful. And that creates the collapse of the national state and the whole of the institutions that have been created throughout 3,000 years and has have been established for the good and safety of the he, of the civilians. And that is the modern state and the democratic state when we allow for that to to get the, the bad roots and to create that negative selection from the socialist and uh, have that capacity of taking on the worst of the worst of the features of the human being and to crush the others then we, we create at the end of the day are uh, just criminal environments which are the one in Venezuela where life, a, f a human life has no value. Is the, what we mentioned before, the arbitrary coming from the left. Well, nowadays the arbitrary is just someone is in the street he, he or she likes your shoes and he shoots you and he takes your shoes. And that is an arbitrary, there is the common day in Venezuela, as Maria knows about it. It's not a rare case, it's something that could happen anywhere and any time. And that 
That's why I believe that we have to convey that message. We are talking about criminals and we cannot negotiate with criminals. We have to put criminals to give up and to give a step back. But if we were able to do it with Suriman, then we could do it as well, be able to do it here. So no one is sleeping quietly in Miraflores and no one is quiet and peaceful among the citizens that are unrestful in Nicaragua, in Venezuela. Those criminals have to be fearful and they should not have safety. And that harassment will provoke them to leave or to find a way out. But as long as they're not fearful, there will be no way out. And the Miraflores Palace is the headquarters of the Venezuelan's government. What Maduro is, Maria mentioned that if you can't fight your enemy, go with him, it's not her statement, it's not her motto. But Maria Corina was mentioning something extremely inter interesting and is to put on the table the lack of impunity. Justice has to be the for all the crimes against humanity in Venezuela. It has to be a real justice. And there cannot be any impunity. How you how would you warranty that regime for those criminals, those murderers, those common criminals, how you warranty that? What's the deadline? What's the prospect? Well, that is a very important topic, Carmen, and is one that is against our position for those who speak about coexistence with criminals and to negotiate the international justice. That is an inadmissible. We cannot have peace without justice, and we have crimes against humanity that are still standing. So the country is hoping to to recover, and there there should be peace for everyone, justice for everyone. And there were some crimes that were disguised as opposition, and it's not true. And that is part of the process that we have ahead. And, and we will have to look for a new leadership, but we have to warranty for the truth to come up. Ojalá sea pronto ese escenario el que estás describiendo y viva Venezuela. Muchas gracias. Ahora vamos a dar paso a, al presidente de Vox. We're going to present now Santiago Abascal, the president of Vox. Good afternoon, Santiago Abascal. We're in Madrid, I guess. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon and thank you very much, Carmen and Herman. It is an honor to share this, rel this space with such relevant personalities that belong to the patriotic conservative movement in Europe and Latin America. I was really listening, moved to Corina Machado. It's been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to listen to the so very eloquent reflections shared in the summit during the past three days. It's, it humbles me to see that that initiative put into motion some months ago through the Madrid Forum and the Madrid Chart is now growing, gaining shape, and making stronger the bonds between Europe and Latin America. And this brings hopes to all of us, not only to me and people who are here, but very specifically to thousands of people in Europe and Latin America who foresaw very many years have felt politically abandoned without a powerful united and determined voice that defends freedom, 
democracy and the homeland from the attacks from global from social communism and globalism on both sides of the Atlantic. So see you all here, this great movement we're forging against the great threats that our nations face makes me feel truly proud. I am sure that many people out there will be very hopeful to listen to us and also uh, the enemies will pretend not to see us and will ignore us, but they will be taking good note and they will be concerned. Many, many people feel hopeful seeing us here working together because we've been through too many years of weakness and self-awareness amongst the center and right-wing forces, years of lack of will, lack of political determination, of uh, taking it in the chin, of fake consensus here and there. We are not here for that. We didn't come here to manage somebody else's castle. We didn't come here to inherit a system imposed on us from the left, be it the communists in Latin America, or the wealthy progressives we suffer here in Europe. We are not condemned to suffer that forever. We truly know how important the cultural battle is, and that's exactly what we are doing in this summit. As I was saying, it's not set in stone that our siblings in Latin America must suffer narco-communism for eternity. And it's not set in stone that Europe has to remain suffering has to remain progressive forevermore. All of us are leaders of political parties and very different movements with different problems and different concerns depending of the country we come from, but we are all united by our thirst for freedom, the love of the homeland, our history and our customs. We are also united to defend democracy and justice. I am totally convinced that these are the very weapons with which we'll wage the war, and we will win the war. This is the very first summit of many more to come, and we will change the direction of Europe. Thank you very much, Santiago. Herman, he was talking about enemies and opponents. Where are they in Latin America and Europe? Well, these are political opponents. We have so very many enemies. They want to destroy our lifestyle, and they want to erase us as a political option, and as a lifestyle option as well. They want to erase history. So we have many enemies, and we need to deal with them. We have a Giorgia Meloni from the ECR Europe. We would like to listen to you and your analysis, your wrapping up of this summit, and what do you think that the public and the audience in Latin America and Europe might think? Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to congratulate the ECR group and every single person that has contributed to the amazing success of this summit. And everyone who has supported this event, Carlo Fidanza and all the other co-presidency members. I'd like to greet, to warmly greet Santiago Vascal. He is a, a referent for all of us. We have dealt with many important issues and we have uh, brought about many proposals. We want a change in Latin America based in the values of truth democracy, common identity, as, brother, as brothers. These orchestrated efforts must be geared towards dismantling these forces, forces reunited in the Sao Paulo Forum 
because these political movements defend communism and support criminal regimes. We need to oppose them frontally. This organization, we need to fight it politically and legally. I support, I fully support, as Santiago Vascal was saying, the Madrid chart, because we want to give all our support to those who fight for freedom, for private property and democracy. Latin America is the cradle of uh, Western culture as well, and we cannot just let it fall prey of the Cuban regime, the drug traffickers, the ideological violence, and the cancel culture, creating misery, repression, and lack of liberties. We call on these countries like Russia, China, to stop them from colonizing Latin America. And we want to also make Europe aware of this fact. They have let America Latina alone. We see human rights violations in Venezuela, Nicaragua, and no one does anything. The situation must change. For us, the European conservatives, this is an utmost priority. Last but not least, as I am Italian, as I am Italian there are so many citizens in Latin America that have Italian origins. I want to greet them and I want to honor them. Some of them are on the forefront fighting for freedom and democracy in Venezuela and other nations. Fratelli d'Italia, with all the family of ECR, is with you. You are not alone. Thank you very much to everyone and keep up the good work. Santiago Abascal, she has uh, touched upon many issues and rather positively when we talk about different ways of defending human rights, depending on the kind of government. Thank you very much, Carmen. The truth is that I really do listen to uh, Ms. Meloni. She shows commitment with what's happening in Latin America. It looks like it was only an issue of interest for Spanish or Portuguese people, but no, that's not the case. So she, as the president of the CR and Fratelli d'Italia knows that it's important. And thank you very much for your commitment because we have always felt the sensitivity and support towards democracy and freedom in that area. So I'm honored and content of being here together with her in this project. Thank you very much, Santiago and Giorgia Meloni. Would you like to uh, give us a last sentence, a sentence to wrap up? And we can also wave goodbye to those people who follow us remotely, but we feel you very closely, thanks to technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. A last message, just a sentence? OK. My last sentence is that we need to fight together. Uh, that uh, that we uh, we need to build um, a big net between the conservative forces, and we are able to do that. For our ideas, they are strong, and they can free peoples, and that is what we are we are working for. And I'm very proud of uh, uh, my Spanish friends. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm very proud about the, 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 the job, with the, the work we are doing together. So we will keep on. And uh, 
uh, American, uh, uh, Latin American people who are fighting for freedom, they, they are not alone. They have, they have lots of uh, brothers and friends uh, all over the world, and we are uh, taking this net together to help them. Claro que sí. Vamos a construirla. Of course. We're going to ask to Santiago also the very last words. Thank you very much, Carmen, Germán. I wanted to use this opportunity to offer Madrid as the place in which the second summit of ECR Eurolab will take place because it's a privileged region and it's the symbol of the connection of Latin America and and Spain, and also can congregate all the conservative forces and every, Euro and every European. This is a historic bond we share, and that's why I make extensive this invitation with the great hope of building up this summit. It'd be a great pleasure to host this event. I'm deeply thankful, so a heartfelt thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, Santiago Abascal. So, the icing on the cake for the summit. Thank you very much. I'm so very honored to have um, Melonia Abascal here with us. It's just magnificent. This summit has been outstanding. And this is the official beginning of the battle of our alliance, the alliance of democratic patriotic forces against narco-socialism, communism. There, here, everywhere. The Madrid chart, I recommend you to sign it and support it because that is the starting point, so to say. It is very brief, but this is the blueprint of our battle. And we, there's so much at stake. The future of our grandchildren is at stake, and we need to protect this great achievement of the Western civilization. We need to save it and rescue it and long life to it. This is our goal in ECR, and I reiterate my heartfelt thank you for our guests, Melanie and Abascal. So this way we do close this first summit, and we do begin the next session. We will see where will it be host. Thank you so very much to all the participants that have been following us in these three days, people that have been following us through the social media. And to those people who will be capable of seeing the whole replay of the session through YouTube, Facebook, and everything else, and you will be able to follow up the um, comments. And see you in Madrid. Thank you very much, and good afternoon.